Okay. Still is as the screen is screen is completely black. I don't know why. Oh yeah, it's getting better. It's getting better. So just a second, the final tunings. And then I'm good to go. Just need to figure it out. This to be this needs to be placed a bit better. Oh, hold on, hold on. Here. <clears throat> Okay, almost there. Last connection. Okay. So how is it? Much better. Much better. Still I have no views. Hmm. So who is missing? Am I wrong in place or are you guys in the wrong place? Look at this, still, you know, something, is it because of what it is doing like this? I don't know. But have to be okay. But I'm still missing you guys. Oh, okay, so finally I got you. All right, so let me just uh, set up the <coughs> soccer Eve and then we get to go. Yeah, of course, I would like to have more students than uh, two. I'm up the one of the one of the two is it just the one student in addition to me. Could be. Okay. Oh, six students. Oh, okay. Looks looking much better already. Yeah, we will get started momentarily. Just doing the final settings and then uh, then we okay. Here. Yeah. All right, the first Socrative is already on. It looked that there's already like um, 42 students. I guess that I need to clear the room. I guess that's. Yep, I'm going to clear the room. And it's cleaned. Okay, I'm going to finish this. And restart it again. No, still I got that, like too many students. No, 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 not that either. Launch, here. This is the place to go. Okay, looking better now. But how still seems to have uh, 42 students in my soccer team. I guess that's uh, a ghost, some kind. Anyways, happy to be back after uh, three visiting lectures, I'm happy to deliver lecture by myself. And what will happen today is that I gonna explain you the topic that we were unable to complete, what was it, four weeks ago. Uh, okay, before I get started, so there is a question, quick question, how does the Okay, so why, so how does it affect, so if not completing one component of the simulation work? Um, okay, let's try to figure it out, let's, uh, because this is an important question, I wanted to answer that question before we are jumping into technical matters. So the question was that, how is a final grading of this class, how that is composed? And I can see that my, my green screen is not in a good position today because for some reason, I, you know, it seems that there's a quite a bit of, uh, you know, movement in my back. And that's obviously because of the green screen. All right. But this question, you know, first of all, 
very important observation is this, that the final grading will be based on uh, here. What is this? Oh, oh I think I'm having the wrong pen. Yep, now it's better. Okay, so the final grading is half and half. Half and half in the sense that 50% will come from written exam and 50% will come from the simulation assignment. And, you know, when I'm saying the 50, uh, you know, half and half, I really don't mean half and half because, you know, we do have additional components here in the final grading. And these additional components are because of the in-class quizzes. Now, in-class quizzes can upgrade your, your uh, final grade by 10%. 10%. Okay, but the question was that, okay, the 50% the is from written exam, another 50% is for a simulation assignment. So what if you are unable to complete one part of the simulation assignment, how much that will affect? Not so much, because it affects this 50%. So even if you are unable to finish certain part of the, um, the simulation work, you know, it can lower your grading from the simulation assignment a little bit. Let's say that in the worst possible scenario, it can take 10% off. You know, it could be 50%, you know, 40. Now, hypothetically, you're scoring the highest possible grade from your written exam. This is 40 plus 10, which means that this should be plus as well. You know, this is the in-class quizzes, so you can still get 100%. So, something that you, look, you can live with. Now, how serious is the component that is missing? and how seriously it will be accounted. Uh, that's uh, something that the Surats will make a call on that. So I highly recommend it to discuss with Surats to see how he feels about that. And particularly, it would be important to learn how critical Surats feels that that missing component is. Okay, hopefully he's answering your question. And let's see what else we have. So we have question about the, what is a LU, I mean the room, Socrates room, and that's a LUT. Okay, so uh, so it seems that it's working so that the model is working okay, except that the pressures are exploding. Without checking your, your case, this could be something that you could figure it out with help of students. <laughs> so often the explosion, because the, if the pressure is exploding, it's somewhat simple to figure it out by, by looking at what are the components you have in your pressure equation, in pressure differential equation. Let me take these drawings off. What happened here? Now I moved up my screen a bit. Hopefully it's still okay. All right, so... This is P dot. You know, the P dot can be computed in a way that there is a effective bulk modulus. And then the size of the, the volume you are looking at. Flow rate in, flow rate out, and then this final component that is, you know, the pressure or the change of the, the, and the volume you're looking at. Uh, now, typically the problems are related to this component, the flow rate in, flow rate out, those are having the incorrect sign. So that's that's the typical reason. So I'm recommending you to check those equations one more time. And now you may have a several differential equations that are describing all the pressures in your system. Make sure that you're checking each one of them. And check, you know, make a very small simulation in forward of time. Let's say that you are simulating just, um, let's say this amount of time which is a 0 0.01 second. And look at that carefully. Look at the uh, monitoring, the, how the pressures are increasing, how the flows are increasing, and so on and so forth. And as soon as you can see something that is unlogical, that's where the problem is located at. But of course, this is a very general instructions and you know it's very case dependent, but still simulated in a very, very small time period. Look like, you know, if the pressure is going up, you know, what is causing that? Is it that because of the flow rate is coming in? What is the source of that? So that's my advice. Another advice, the same matter is that the police have a meeting with the Surats. So if you are unable to pinpoint the problem by yourself, Surats will come and help you. 
Um, so, um, so what happens is if I'm going to take zero from Surat's part of the work? Well, that's going to be a serious problem because, you know, the mandatory items that are needed in a final grading are written exam and simulation work. So if one is missing, then um, you need to contact us and we need to figure out the special, some kind of special uh, assignment to you. But uh, both need to be accomplished one way or another. And you know that the written exam this year, extreme, extremely simple. So not difficult at all, because I'm going to give you all the questions. Yeah. You have plenty of time to prepare yourself to those questions. So it should be OK. All right, so let me try to clear the screen again. Now let me finally get started for today's lecture. You know, yesterday, when I was preparing today's lecture, I realized something extremely important. And something extremely important is this, that I need two weeks to, to wrap up the course. I, um, I'm unable to close all the necessary topics within the week, or, I mean, within the next uh, hour and a half. I need more time than that. Otherwise, it's going to be just, you know, I will, I will be too much in a hurry. So it's not making sense to do it so well. So what I'm planning to do today is that I want to have, you know, this is supposed to be like this. And I want to finalize the discussion about the conduct modeling. There are still a few things to discuss in that regard. And <clears throat> then something kind of like two topics that are heavily related to each other, stress evaluation and fatigue prediction based on multi-body system dynamics. And uh, first of all, they're heavily related because uh, to make a fatigue prediction, you need to know the stresses. And uh, that's where you need this first step. This is going to be somewhat straightforward. I'm not taking too much of a time to explain that, um, that thing. Then the fatigue prediction is going to be like a big picture about the fatigue of all these structures. We are not going to step too much into details, but I would like you to be aware of the certain things that are um, important. Uh, okay, so there is a there is a thing that I, can I can I move my mic? So is it too loud or too low voice? Which one it is? Because rather than moving my mic, I could simply tune my voice here. So let me take a look at the comment. Too low, too low. So you need more volume. All right. So how is this? Is it getting better? Because my, there is, here's my mic. So it's as close as my mouth that it can be. All right. So is it better? So I, I put my volume up. At least what I can see here in my control table is that uh, my voice voice goes often to yellow, not really in a red, but should be okay. So it's good. Now it's better. Okay. So and then the final thing, which probably unable to close today, but I'm gonna close that next week is a large deformation. Not really because of the large deformation, but something that I would like you to be aware of. And something that I would like you to be aware of is the isogeometric analysis. And that's uh, kind of like, well, of course, a matter of opinion in a certain level, but some people say that that's a future of structural strength analysis. Okay, what is this isogeometric analysis and how that's going to change your life? That's what we're going to discuss in the very end of uh, all these technical matters. All right, next week, next week, summary and how to prepare yourself to midterm exam and possibly this large deformation will go to next week as well. Then a little bit of something that I desperately want to share with you. You may not like it, but I desperately want to share my views and my experiences about master thesis work. And, and I don't expect that you know, you to learn in a way that I'm asking something in the written exam regarding the master thesis work. Another thing that I desperately want to share with you is a career counseling. I want to keep my views regarding 
what really makes sense you to do and what you should not do. Equally important to know what to do is to know what not to do. And I'm going to emphasize certain common mistakes in terms of career counseling. And I'm addressing this talk, but particularly to international students. But, and our Finnish students, they can benefit from this talk as well. All right, so that's what's going to happen. Now, there is a several uh, questions, you know, there is an important question that uh, when the next exam will be. Yeah, I know when the next exam will be. So if you look at the university website, it says that the next exam will be on. Okay, now I don't remember that so well, but I think it is 7th of May. Midterm exam, midterm exam. Okay, let me figure it out for you because um, this for sure is important information to know. So it's uni.lut.fi that tells when the exam will be. And then selecting here exams and midterm exams and then based on departments and I'm able to find the course that is entitled as a simulation laboratory course. All right, so here it is. I was right about that. So the next midterm exam is officially, uh, let me emphasize, officially designed to be on 7th of May. And the final exam is, or will be on 12th of May. So 7th of May, 12th of May. Now, this is a particular the day that I'm curious to know your views in this day, because, um, you know, what will happen is that we are able to close all the lectures within two weeks. So let me open my calendar. Where can I find my calendar? I think it is this one. So just that you can get an idea what's going on here. Um, all right, so now this one needs to be moved here. Okay, so right, like I said, so we are able to close all the lectures next week, so which is the 14th of April. And now if we would like to have the exam, midterm exam, so I'm referring to midterm exam here, on its official day. That would mean that there are, well, roughly, well, there's actually more than a three weeks before, I mean, the, between the la last lecture and the midterm exam. And of course, that's okay. I can organize it that way. But I was just thinking that your best interest would be to have it earlier than that. And I'm thinking that what about having the midterm exam in week, which is a 19th of April, that's, um, you know, maybe on Friday, which is a 23rd of April, or it could be Thursday, perhaps, 22nd of April. So the choices are, I'm going to set that to some kind of a voting action to figure it out if this is okay to you. So it could be 22nd of April at 16 to, you know, three hours from that. Or, you know, so it could be some other days as well. But why why to change? Like, what is the reason to change the date? And the reason, obviously, is the fact that, you know, if we would change the date, then you would have, you know, less time between your last lecture and the written exam. All right, then, then I got the quite a bit of communication. Oh, okay, what means the final exam? All right, that's a good question. <clears throat> And then there is a question like, how many exams left? And there is a question that can be organized even earlier than, don't know what that is referring, but, so let me get started from, um, uh, by answering the, what the final exam means. Okay, now we have two choices to carry out the um, written examinations. Remember, we have this, Grading, which is 50% written exam, 50% simulation assignment, 10% about the in-class quizzes. So I'm speaking about this particular part, which is a written exam only. You can do this in two 
alternative ways. So you can make it happen by using two meet term exams or final exam. Those are alternatives. So you can select one out of the two options. My advice, of course, is the midterm exam. And why is that? Because, you know, the midterm exam, you need to master only the, the fraction of the course at the time. So it's easier, much easier. But if for some reason you are busy when the midterm exam is organized, then it left you no other choice than participate the final exam. So those are the two choices. So hopefully that is answering the question about, you know, what is a final exam? How many exams we have left? So you have, if you select this midterm exam option, you have one more midterm exam left. So it's going to be two midterm exam in total. One is, okay, sorry about this time, you know, the fingering thing, but you know, the, the, the one is already covered, one is left. All right. Um, then uh, let me see. Then there's another uh, question that is it possible to organize exam a bit earlier? Okay, 23rd. Uh, sure, we can. I'm planning to organize a dual voting or um, some kind of voting action that I can learn your desires regarding the date. Um, okay, 23rd is not a good date because there is a fluid power exam. Sure, I understand that. I want to appreciate that that this is some this is an information I, that I'm not fully aware of, but it makes a big difference. So please let me know. Uh, okay, can can you uh, do you need to go to all three exams? No, you don't. You don't. So if you select midterm exam, then you do two midterm exams. But if you do a final exam, then you do the final exam. But then you do not participate the midterm exam. I'm gonna. When I'm sending the information about the voting, I'm, I will let you, I will make sure that you you know the rules. These rules, by the way, you can find it out when you look at the first uh, lecture of this course. Okay, then we got the dates that are proposed here: 30th, so um, April 30th. Th uh, let me see what day is that. 30th is Friday. Okay, so the idea is to have an exam in a week 17, which is a Monday 26th of April, and the Friday is 30th. Honestly, I don't like that idea. I don't like it because this is particularly for your sake. Oh my God, how come uh, this slow? You know, I, mean, I don't get it in a business. I've got to keep on talking about these practical matters. Soon I will jump to the business. No, the end of the April is a, one day before the Labor Day. And you guys are supposed to be wasted. You're supposed to be, you know, drinking heavily, having parties, this kind of thing. You shouldn't go to exam on that time. So not recommended to you. Okay. All right. I'm going to put the several different choices and, uh, and let's see which one out of the several different choices is the one that you like the most. All right, so let me finally, okay, the, yeah, 20, yeah, what I like to, the like 22nd of April at um, 3, excuse me, 4 p.m. would be good. It could be Wednesday too, like 21st of April. But again, I'm going to set the voting action so you can um, have your, you can tell me your opinion. And please, I'm going to also make sure that there's like a text field that you can explain, you know, that there are some restrictions to you that I cannot participate this particular day. And I want to present those things. Right. So a lot of visiting lectures. Here's my view about these visiting lectures and uh, upcoming topics as well. Uh, I put it in um, X, Y, axis in a way that x-axis is a level of expertise needed, which um, is kind of like uh, something that how many years is needed to master these topics in a, in a way that you are really can, or you can really call yourself as an expert of the area. And then the, the y-axis here is like how widely you can apply these techniques. 
And of course, they're not completely in a scale, but it gives you a little bit of an idea. You know, you know, the level of expertise needed in the biomechanics is not as huge that you may think that it is. And the reason behind it is that, you know, the biomechanics is having the same elements that in uh, any other modeling. So it's having these, these bone structures that are equal and then the steel structures in a, in a machine. It's having the muscles that are equal and then the actuators, hydraulic actuators, perhaps if you want, uh, pneumatic actuators, but they're actuators. Then the control scheme is the only clear difference. But other than that, you know, the, the biomechanics is amazingly close to other modeling tasks. Bicycle dynamics is same thing is an application of multi-body system dynamics, but you know how well it can be applied is, is limited because we're speaking about the two-wheel vehicles. So it's only bicycles, which of course is commonly used vehicle, but and the mice and the motorcycles, but that's about it. So it's not so often used. What we're gonna learn later is the stress evaluation and associated to welding thing and the, the, the fatigue of welder structures. This is good to know, good to keep in mind. Contact modeling is below that. Contact modeling, for sure, you find it very often, but still is not super critical thing to know. Product life cycle management, something for sure each one of you will face, particularly if you are moving to industry. That's something that you need to deal with. And hopefully you get an idea of some kind, what is the product life cycle management? based on the wisdom English. All right, now finally, let's move on to contact because this is what we're supposed to discuss today. And this contact description is not gonna be that extensive discuss. It's somewhat brief discuss. And we already looked four weeks back that the contact modeling is something that you do need in many different applications. Like in the game technology, it's often used, and we look at these uh, rally games and how the contact takes a plane in the rally games or car games. Sure, it's needed there, and it's needed in many other game applications. But of course, it's needed in um, in application of mechanical engineering as well. Today, we're going to learn, you know, what it really means if you do the the contact modeling in an extensive way when there's a lot of possible contacts, not just the handful of the contacts, but a lot of them. And a lot of them would be that uh, we are speaking about millions of possible contacts. All right, we learned that the contact modeling consists of two phases, two steps. And the first step is a contact detection. It's a contact detection like discipline. There's an own discipline that is looking at the ways that one can detect possible contacts. Of course, this is important. I mean, important and simple sometimes. It could be simple sometimes if we are speaking about just a few possible contacts. But soon when, when you, we are looking at the, you know, the contacts in the practical problems, soon it becomes clear that there's a lot of, a lot of hundreds of thousands different possibilities of contacts. And you cannot just do it in a way that you're scanning all these possible contacts every single time step and try to figure it out whether or not there's a contact. That's, that's not gonna be computationally efficient enough. You need to figure it out something more clever than that, uh, something more systematic than that. Uh, the most often used method is this bounding box method that as the title implies, is a method where you have a boxes and you have an object under the or inside of the boxes. And you're just checking out if the boxes are colliding with each other. And if they do, you're moving on to more details, uh, detections. And once you are in a really in a final level, then you're actually looking at if the drawing objects are colliding or penetrating. So that's what we learned four weeks back. Then comes another thing, which is a contact event. All right, so we figure it out. Yes, there is a ball, not ball, but oval shaped structure, which is flying in the space. And yes, it is colliding with the surface here. Okay, so we see that there is a contact here. What next? What next? 
basically. Now, now you need to pay attention to me because I'm going to tell you something that may be very beneficial in your life in future. So we have two alternatives when we are thinking about how the contact itself can be modeled. We can use a method that is called smooth dynamics. Smooth dynamics means that we are kind of smoothly introducing the forces that are pushing these objects away from each other. Or we can use non-smooth dynamics. A non-smooth dynamics is like, like clear cut cases. You could say like, okay, this object can do whatever they want, except they cannot proceed from this further. And it's same than dealing with constraints. Same than dealing with the constraints, except the constraints are unequalities. So we are having them in a little bit of different format. This easily leads to system that is having the non-smooth nature, which can be treated numerically. That's possible to treat it numerically. But these are roughly speaking two choices. Most often used one. Well, okay, now I need to back up a little bit because actually it depends your skills and your applications, which one is the most often used one. But let's say that in a practical engineering life, the smooth dynamics is something you can see often, more often than non-smooth dynamics, because it's easy to implement. It doesn't really need that particular skills in terms of treating the, the numerics. So it's easier, much easier. Okay, so those are the two choices. And this is something that I might ask. Again, what are the questions that I can ask in written exam? Those will be released to you on next week, Wednesday. All right. So this is what we look already. So contact detection, this is uh, something that um, we are not going to look anymore today. But these two different approaches, smooth, non-smooth dynamics, we're going to learn well, the, the methods inside. So the one we're going to, once we first, excuse me, first, we're going to take a look at the smooth dynamics, and we're going to look at the method that pretty much everyone knows. It's a penalty force method. It just says that, okay, if there is a two bodies contacting, we're allowing them to penetrate. And based on the amount of penetration, we are pushing them away from each other by introducing a force. And this force is called penalty force because it's kind of penalizing these two bodies because they are colliding each other. Think about like uh, two individuals that are wanted to have a fight. So they get together and they started to fight. The referee comes into play and they separate and the referee is giving them the penalty. So it's the same kind of um, idea here. Now, instead of referee, there is a penalty force that is separating them. Uh, the penalty force will be based on how much penetration they do. So you do more penetration, more penalty you get. So it's simple like that. Now this non-smooth dynamics part, that's uh, the kind of the topic we're gonna look at there is a cone complementary approach. What a monster, but don't get confused about the monster, but think about that this is something that context will be dealt with like inequalities. You say that, okay, you know, the X can be pretty much anything it wants, but it cannot go through the surface. So it could be equation like this. And this equation is then accounted in equation of motion. Similar way that, you know, you can have an equation that says, you know, like this, constraint, which is equal. This is always bigger or equal than zero or other than values, but that's kind of the nature of this second approach. Okay, so with that, penalty force. Okay, so it's very straightforward. So basically what you do is that you are allowing two geometries to penetrate. And here's an example for you. So um, we have here a ball, the, the one that is blue in a color, and it is touching the surface that is here, defining the crown by here. And you can see that there's a certain amount of penetration. And the penetration is um, denoted as X here. And now what we're gonna do is that we're simply gonna introduce the force, which is gonna be equal than 
or let's say first the force that is a function of x the higher the x larger the x bigger the force like we discussed already now how that gonna make it happen how you gonna make it happen well you're gonna make it happen in a way that you have um, stiffness parameter that is having like physical interpretation in a sense that is describing the material between the ball and the surface and then we have this x and usually the x is not written like that but the x is the power of something why soon you're gonna learn that too okay so that's a penalty force it's so simple like that so what happens next is that you're gonna get this force here you're gonna put that as a part of the equation of motion and equation of motion you know you can have external applied forces this will be treated like external applied forces that's it so it's very straightforward all right what about this force in details then how it look like okay the penalty force is like i explained earlier you know is a function of two parameters stiffness and penetration penetration comes from the simulation itself not much you can do about it and then the stiffness is interpreting or expressing what's the materials to materials that are contacting each other and now if you think about you know this one here going back to this figure you know if you think of this uh, two steel material the the blue ball and the crown grain color are penetrating each other amount that is clearly visible you know you can see that there's a clearly x that is pretty big so what do you think what is going to happen this well it's going to introduce a quite a bit of force so the force that will separate these two objects from each other will be large having the large numerical value and it can be so large that really this ball will fly really far off from the ground and this is something that is important because this method even though that is very often used it is a little bit sensitive for parameter settings and the one parameter that is important is how stiff is the contact how does the stiffness value between the contact components that's something that is important another thing that this is a little bit sensitive of is you know you need to make sure that your computation proceed with this small time step now let me tell you why all right let's take this ball up from the ground like let's place it in this direction you know what happens in a, in a simulation is that you're moving on with this certain time step now let's say in a time step time equal to zero you here and then uh, you're comparing the next time so let's say that t is equal to t1 you here and then uh, in your third time step which is here t equal to 2 you're just about to contacting the surface and then what happens in the next time step t equal to 3 you're penetrating this much you're penetrating significantly and now if you think about that you're having the stiffness this guy here that is corresponding the steel value this ball will fly really far so if you look at the situation from the moon so it's going to pass the moon for sure so it's going to disappear it will uh, cause the situation where the system is exploding how you can get rid of that well first of all you need using the smaller time step such that you can see that okay you know there is a possibility of penetration and the next time step will be very small that you can detect that there's a little bit of force that comes into play and you're smoothly pushing the ball off from the ground or you play with the stiffness those are the two choices okay so here are the two choices well i mentioned shortly about shortly about this exponential component that is uh, associated to penetration typically this exponential component is having the numerical value other than one other than one because one is introducing us a, a more small problem the small problem is the discontinuity so if you think about situation that you're approaching let's say that you have this ball it's approaching the ground you're traveling from 
I think it should be this direction, measure this direction. You're approaching here the system. So there's no forces, no forces, no forces, no forces. Suddenly you hit the spot. You see what happens in this spot. There are two linear curves that are attached to each other. But because there are two linear curves, there's a discontinuity here. There is a little jump here, a little step here. This is what the numerical integrators hate big time. No matter what, they always want to see life as a smooth because of the smooth dynamics. How you can make it smooth? Well, have the value other than one. So let's say 1.2 would be okay already. Two would be even better. So now this, what, what this is doing is for you is, is progressively increasing the force and is having the smooth transition from zero force to whatever value you are looking at. So that's what it is often used. This is a trick to smoothen your dynamics. Okay. Well, these are just a little bit of different curves. I don't think they are particularly interesting at this time. That's just showing like how the different values of this exponential will look like. And as you can see that, you know, even the small chains here will introduce this smoothness, which we are desperately looking at. Okay, and example, example is here. This is something that uh, was made together with UCS Open in a million years ago. Yeah, more than a million years ago. Um, this was, um, honestly, I don't remember the year, but say uh, 25 years ago, maybe even more than that. So there was a project where we wanted to use, uh, where we wanted to model the bearings, different kind of bearings in multi-body software and in the multi-body framework. And what we did was that we actually modeled the, the bearings by using this simple penalty force approach. It looks nasty and it looks like scary even, but actually when you are settling down and you are allowing yourself to familiarize yourself to this equation, and you can end up that this is nothing except this simple contact forces. A lot of them, of course, but still, you know, the, the concept behind is not so crazy difficult. You know, you have here stiffness, what like we learned already. This time the stiffness comes from the certain additional parameters like a fluid field, film, the material, and so on and so forth. And then this penetration. And the penetration, look at the power, the N here is 1.5. And what you do with this equation is that you are computing forces for all possible directions. I mean, the single kind of like imaginary ball is experiencing these forces. And when you have these forces, the inner and outer ring find the imbalance. And that's the system is modeled. So it's fairly straightforward, even though that is looking scary in the beginning. It is getting even scarier and it's got it getting even scarier because we introduce quite a bit of parameters to deal with there's some uh, manufacturing uh, errors that were introduced the model some tolerances and so on and so forth but how it finally operates is like this so so it seems to work because, you know, you look at the force that the force is fluctuating here and that tells that it's about to rise because, you know, the fluctuating the situation where, okay, hold on. So the, where there's a two balls like this, force is traveling through these two balls like here and here. And then uh, there's a one pole like here and the force is traveling through this one ball. And that's why the stiffness is fluctuating a, a little bit. And there is this uh, force fluctuation. And now it makes it possible to have a different kind of like experiment. Let me see what is here. I think this is just a pretensioning that is played with nothing else. But we can make inner or outer ring to be oval in a shape, which usually happens because in a lathe, you know, the lathe typically having uh, three fingers that are pressing the, the cylindrical shape body because they're pressing by using three fingers they can easily deform the structure to having the oval form and now when you make them round 
it's small, but when you release these fingers, it pops up to be in a triangular shape. That's easily what happens. And now when you have a triangular shape, you know what that, that affects to the performance, it's on here. So it affects, of course. I think that the current uh, manufacturing devices can deal with this too. I mean, that they can understand that, you know, the three fingers can cause a deformation and they can compensate that in a manufacturing process. At least in a high positioning manufacturing, for sure, they can make it happen. And then something more serious than this is a inner ring where there is a fatty crack. And the fatty crack is traveling, causing these impulses or force fluctuations. Okay. All based on penalty forces. So penalty force is our friend. Simple to use. Very straightforward. Okay, so uh, now I lost my mouse here. Okay, so um, what's up, by the way? Soon there's going to be in class quiz. And I'm not going to give you any additional devices for in class quiz. So let's see how well we're going to perform. All right. Listen what I'm about to say to you. It helps in surviving an in-class quiz. Summary about the penalty forces. Simple to use. It is. Integration settings need to be selected with care because, you know, this is something that is vulnerable of. So it can easily cause the situation that things are exploding because accidentally too much penetration. Is very often used method. It can easily uh, describe the situation with the multiple contacts. So it's not a problem to put it in a position like that. That's going to be okay. It can uh, have all the other kind of features, but this integration setting is it's not as so strong as so. It is actually uh, something that is not strong. Okay. My class quiz is this. Contact force can be described using penalty forces. Drawback problem associated to this method is damping is difficult to describe multiple contacts are difficult to describe method is sensitive to integration settings and the game is on my guess today is this look at that 95 yes 95 not 100 but but high Okay, so let me see if the what's going on in your end. Hold on, where is my soccer team here? Kind of lost the soccer team. Where? There, there. Oh yeah, there's already thirteen answers or in the soccer team. Okay, so let me here. Here's my OBS. What? No, 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 not that, not that. I don't want to show that, but I want to show here, this one. Mm. It's kind of small, but at least I'm able to read that it says that there is a 19. Let me see. 19 answers. Uh, the game is on. I can see the, okay, yeah, there's a one guy that is saying 100%. I like it. I like it. Very nice. Now, you know, th today I'm not completely happy about my background. Maybe because the lightning condition is not perfect today. I don't know. But it will do the job. And the number of answers is 20. I have 23 students in my YouTube channel. As I'm in a control room and I can see your comments and you can see that um, maybe, you know, it would be reasonable to expect to have a couple more answers. Now I got 25 uh, views 
in YouTube channel. So uh, let's wait a little while and then I'm going to release this information. And then we're going to learn about um, many body dynamics. Many body dynamics is an interesting thing. Uh, it's based on these non smooth approaches because the non smooth approaches allows you to look at a really high number of contacts and really high number of contacts we can deal about uh, possible contacts of millions, even more than that. Uh, usually this um, kind of moving away from conventional multibody dynamics and we start looking at particles. Particles, your favorite topic comes here again. So now, why this particle is, is something that people are capable to deal with that many number of particles? Of course, comes from the fact that the particle do not have this rotational degrees of freedom uh, because they're missing this degree, rotational degrees of freedom. The description is simple and makes it possible to have a lot of them. All right, but let's not jump to that right away. So let's first look at the how is we doing in in-class quizzes. And as far as I can see that I got no more answers, so I had 21 answers. So I guess that's about it today. So momentarily, I'm going to close the in-class quiz. So 20, what is it? 22. Why this is, by the way, so small font. Oh, here it goes. Here it goes. Much better already. And the winner today is, let me see. That's good. That's really good. So 91, 91. So let me see the winner. Oh, let me close this, hide this from you. Okay, so, oh yeah, we got one jackpot here. Jackpot, nice, very nice. I'm not gonna mention the winner because I'm sure it's against the legislation of some kind, but we do have a winner. Nice, congratulations. Plus minus one, yes, of course. Of course, plus minus one, meaning that um, there it is. Now, uh, we've got more winners. Uh... There, yeah, we got quite a many winners. There. <laughs> uh, no, no, not plus minus five, but plus minus one. Plus minus one is okay. Yeah, yeah, you got it right, you got it right. Congratulations. Now, with that, where I am. Here, okay, so I promised many, many body dynamics and non smooth um, dynamics. All right, so this honestly is an extremely painful topic. You know, learning the, the details about this is everything except enjoyable. So it's, it's extremely painful. But for you, I think it is enough to kind of to, to be able to, to see the big picture. Now, the big picture is this. You know, you are measuring these uh, distances between the possible components that can have a contact. And you're measuring that by using this, what is this, phi. Now I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Uh, but anyways, you're measuring the distance. And you're measuring the distance in such the way that, you know, you make sure that this is going to be the one that you're expressing your constraints. Is such the way that you know the bodies can have whatever location they want, but they cannot penetrate it each other. And that's gonna be expressed mathematically in terms of inequalities. And inequalities will eventually can be expressed as yeah. it is on here. And now I'm intentionally speaking up here because I feel that for you this time this is enough. This is enough to know. You don't need to jump in at details, but if you want to learn the details, there is a plenty of material available. And it's about the contacts, non-smooth contacts, and the count complementary is something, another keyword that you can search when we are when you are dealing with the situation. This is an experiment that we did in, in LUT. This was a while ago. And we have here bodies, poles, that are, 
you know, dropping from the sky and they having the context. So this is still reasonable. So it's not overly difficult. So we're speaking about reasonable number of bodies. But, you know, when you are typing something like Dan Nekut, and look at his Vimeo videos, you can find out that there is a stuff, examples that there is a millions and millions of particles and he's even describing the fluid behavior using the same approach. So it's somewhat powerful approach. So let me introduce my friend, Dan Necker, the one that is behind of these videos to you. So here's Dan Necker and let's hear what he says about um, many body dynamics. Uh, and let me see, now that the question is that, let, let me just check like, whether or not this voice goes off. Nothing so far. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dan Egrut. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin. No, no, no I don't want to have that. I want to have it directly to you, not via my mic. So just, just a second. Now I got confused. I have so many. What is that I should look at? Just a second. I will be momentarily capable to solve this thing. I think it is this one. You guys were able to hear this earlier. Or no? Okay, so let me see how it is now. Okay, I'm going to play this again. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dan Egrut. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin in Medicine, and I want to start by thanking you for taking the time for, to attend to my presentation here. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, this topic of uh, taking the leap from multi-body dynamics to many-body dynamics. And let me first tell you what multi-body dynamics is. In general, multi-body dynamics looks, for instance, at the motion of, of this vehicle. In this case, this is a project that we have with the JPL. And you have a vehicle with a, a relatively small number of parts. What makes this a many-body problem is when you start looking at the granular terrain that the, ter the, the vehicle moves over. And in, 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 in reality, what they're interested in, uh, they want to see if this vehicle gets stuck in the sand. Now, in one cubic meter of sand, you have about 1.5 billion particles. And although you don't see this in, in this picture, in this in movie, sorry, those, those small parts, they move. And you solve some equations of motion, and they come back to tell you at each time step that I don't move, I don't move, I don't move, I don't move. Once in a while, they move. But nonetheless, we have to solve at each time step a very large problem. Now, this is a simulation that is about probably two or three years old, and I showed it to some army guys, and one of them raised his hand and he said, so why is that uh, uh, Mars rover moving over potatoes? Are, potatoes? are there potatoes on Mars? And, you know, this is, this is my point. Uh, there are no potatoes on Mars, but you cannot go today to very small dimensions for granular material because if you have, for instance, like a commercial off-the-shelf package uh, and you run a dynamics analysis, multi-body dynamics, classical multi-body dynamics analysis, with 32 balls dropping in that bucket and you look at the time evolution of the system, it takes here for, for, for 32 balls about 600 seconds to understand the dynamics for three seconds. And not only that, but if you look at the, the shape of the curve, it takes, it takes, it, the, it, it's a quadratic function that, it, function that describes this uh, uh, dependency, and a very quick back of the envelope computation tells you that if you have one million particles, it takes for three seconds of simulation about 25,000 years to run that analysis. And you know, with all this Medicare discussion and cuts, I'm not going to make it that far. So we need, we need a different solution here. So this is the, this is the solution here. Uh, we change the, the math behind the formulation. And this is a system that has about one million parts. And they're moving and we're tracing the motion of every single particle and how it collides with any other particle in the system. 
and there's like a, a, a ball of a, a lower density material, and it flows on that. So here is classical multi-bidynamics. I'm not going to get into the details, but there was some math, okay, going from multi-bidynamics to many-body dynamics. And once you do you take care of, 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 of this problem from a different mathematical formulation, all of a sudden it becomes feasible, okay? And when it becomes physical, uh, uh, feasible, then the next thing that you want to ask is, well, how close do the results come with respect to reality? And here we have like a, like a silos, like a flat hopper simulation, and we ran that simulation, and then in the lab, we went and we took something similar, uh, a graduate student, low salary, you know, filled it up, painted the bows, and, you know, we did that simulation, and then you put them side by side, and here is what you have, experiment and simulation. And they look pretty much, uh, pretty much the same. And we did some other simulation, but I'm not going to, to share the, the results here. Uh, of course, if you look at this problem, you have millions and millions of bodies that move. Now, the beauty of it is that basically they all move the same. So there is a lot of scope for parallel computing in this. And this is where you can use, for instance, GPU computing or, 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 or multi-core computing. And this is what we did. Uh, and we implemented, for instance, here you have a system that has about half a million uh, parts. And this is a project that we work uh, uh, for the Army. And they're interested in how the terrain deforms on the, uh, a track vehicle. And uh, it took about, for 18 seconds of second simulation, it took about one day to carry out uh, uh, this analysis. Now, you can go beyond that. And I have to tell you that, you know, I grew up in a, in a, in a communist country, and it was like, you know, food, food shortages and such. So one of my recurring dreams was like, you know, eating lots of chocolate. And here, here is it, you know, I can say that I'm a happy man. My dream came true. Either if it's like a virtual world, like, look, I have lots and lots of, sim like, like, chocolate here. Now, the tricky part about this is that it is a simulation that combines uh, multi-domain, uh, uh, multi it, it's a multi-domain uh, uh, physics uh, simulation. It solves at the same time the Navier-Stokes equations and the Newton-Euler. And it's done, in, in, again, in, in a, in a, in a uh, parallel fashion. And if I were to conclude, you know, this discussion, it boils out to one idea. Uh, there, is, there is a lot of computational power today, like parallel computing and such. It takes new math that you can map on that parallel architecture, and wonderful things happen. And with this, I thank you again for taking the time to, 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 to attend my talk. Okay, so with that, so that was a many body. He mentioned TPU versus CPU. You know, many of the things, even uh, other than uh, this contact, um, can be parallelized. You know, there's a possibility to use a parallel computing. And uh, one of the fashionable things that it's not so difficult at the moment, it's more or less doable, is uses graphical process units. And uh, that seems to be very much in fashion at the moment. So many cases are no longer computed by using CPU, but GPU. Okay, so finally, we moving on. Sorry that I'm a little slow today. But maybe this is a... Um, emotional thing i'm feeling that there there is a moment for separation that the moment is getting closer because you know i don't have that many lectures to deliver to you anymore and soon um, we have the last lecture and then there's uh, you know all these hawkings and everything virtual ones and then you will fly away from lut or maybe you can do your thesis under my supervision that i don't know anyways let's close two more topics. I promise that uh, I'm shortly going to discuss about the stress evaluation based on multi-body system dynamics. All right, I'm going to be brief here and it's only, you know, something that um, you really don't need that much of a time to familiarize yourself to this topic. It's fairly straightforward. Idea is, or the need is this, that, you know, in a design task, Often it is very useful to get the knowledge about the stresses and strains. It's more stresses than strains. Strains are not necessarily that much of an interest. But strains, definitely they are something that you would like to learn. You would like to learn like how the stresses are loading your structure. And of course, you would like to compare the stress level against a certain 
design standards and figure it out whether or not you can even introduce some plastic deformation to your structure. And if you do have a plastic deformation, that's not a good idea because that's when you're going to get the permanent damage. So let's say permanent deformation at least, if not damage. Okay, two choices to make it happen. I mean, to get stress evaluation, you can use a, a very brutal approach. And in this brutal force-based approach, you take all the forces that are applying in your system and you're exporting them to finite element software. You know, in a, what happens in a multi-body system dynamics that each time step, your system is in dynamic equilibrium, meaning that your inertia forces, elastic forces, if you're dealing with the flexible bodies, but if you're dealing with the rigid bodies, your inertia forces and externally applied forces are in balance. Okay, so what you can do then is that you can take those two forces and you can export, you can put them back to another software that is capable to to use this as an initial value. And the software that can use them as an initial value is a finite element software. So you can convert your inertia forces as a, as a force component that you will introduce to your finite element model. Point forces, loading forces will be forces like similarly in multi-body system dynamics and in a finite element model. And then what you do then is that you are computing the, the deformation in each time step in your multi-body simulation. You're redoing it, but this time you're redoing that by using a finite element software. Great, so you can get all the post-processing tools in your access, so that's something that is very beneficial, but it's painful and not used that much anymore because it needs a lot of data to be transferred to one software than another. And it sounds like a straightforward, but it's not. It comes with all kind of difficulties. It comes from the fact that, you know, how to introduce the boundary condition in a finite element model, because you have to have the boundary condition. Often it's not straightforward to introduce that. Um, so it's not simple. So you can have uh, uh, other kind of difficulties, which are not making that very attractive approach. An alternative approach, which is more more used today, is simply use the deformation that is computed in multi-body system dynamics and compute the strains based on that. That requires that you have to deal with the flexible bodies and not any kind of description of flexible bodies. You have to use a floating frame reference formulation because otherwise this is gonna be more or less artificial. All right, so let's look at the details. Number one, this taking loads from multi-body system dynamics, put them to multi to finite element software. This, by the way, has a really fancy name. This name is called, I mean, this approach is called linear theory of elastodynamics. So if you look at the really ancient history, historical books about the multi-body system dynamics, this is the way that they introduced the flexibility meaning that they did not really, but they kind of both processed the deformation. That's what it means. Because you're comparing your rigid multi-body system dynamics, let's say that you have four bar mechanism. You take each one of the bodies as a separate system. So let's say that the body in the middle, you take the forces that are applying in a joints. You take inertia forces, all those are in a dynamic equilibrium. You're exporting them to finite element software. I, I'm sorry, my, my head is blocking the view like this. And then uh, you're computing the deformation in your finite element software. And once you compute the deformation, it's gonna be a symbol like this equation. You get this, this displacement. From displacement, you can easily get the strains. And from strains, you can get the stresses. All that is very straightforward in finite element software. So that's option number one. But as mentioned earlier, so not frequently used anymore because it's um, clumsy. So um, it actually needs so much data to be transferred that it's actually inconvenient. And you need to solve so many static loading cases that that too is a 
somewhat cumbersome to do. Okay, but it's possibility. And, you know, maybe the, the final element software is the one, exactly the one that you use to, to model the flexible bodies. Or maybe you just deal with the rigid multi-body dynamics. Okay, here's an alternative. An alternative is kind of clever. Because, you know, here in multi-body system dynamics, when you construct the equation of motion based on the floating frame reference formulation, you're having these model coordinates that are having an interpretation of deformation. So that's what they're standing for. All right, so can we back up from these model coordinates? Can we go from model coordinates to nodal coordinates? Yes, we can. We can, because we do know the deformation modes. So we can use this equation that we learned a while ago. So we can go back to the nodal decrease of freedom. And from nodal decrease of freedom, we can easily go to strains and stresses. How it can be make it happen? We can use this kinematic matrix that I briefly mentioned a couple of weeks back, six weeks back, I think. This is the one that relates the displacement and strain which are vector quantities in general case. And then you have the matrix of elastic coefficients, which relates to strains and stresses. End of the story. So you can combine all this information, this one, this one, and where is it? The modes here, this one. And you can call them, you know, this one here, you can call as a model stress matrix. What is this doing for you? It is doing the, or make it possible for you to predict the distresses based on model coordinates. That's what it's doing for you. All right, then summary, and then we're going to move on to next subject matter. I know that we only have 20, let me see, less than 20 minutes for our final me, fatigue discussion, but should be enough. Okay, first summary. So we are taking these loads cases and we're moving the load cases to the finite element software or we use this model stress matrix. Both are doable but really what is heavily used at the moment is the latter one, this one. Okay, now fatigue analysis. So uh, what, what, what will happen? Now, like, let's back here. So what we're going to do with this information about this stress. So let's say that we have a stress history such that you know, here's a time, here's a stress. We know the, how the stress is fluctuating in a certain component. What is it we can do with this information? Well, first of, all, first of all, we can take a look at the, you know, what are the maximum values and figure it out, like if the maximum stress is less than what the material can stand for. All right, that's kind of this trivial task. I mean, that, and make, make certain, uh, you know, you know, distance between the, you know, this yield value and the maximum stress you can compute to have, a, to have a little bit of safety margin. Okay, that's the first thing you can do. But usually this is not the big problem in many of the mechanical structure. But the problem is that this loading continues and continues and continues. And because it continues, it introduces another failure mode. And another failure mode, which is very common, is a fatigue. Is meaning that the structure is no longer able to stand the loading, but it's getting weaker and weaker, you know, during the operation. And once it is weak enough, then it breaks. So where this weakening is coming from? This weakening is, is a fatigue. And this stress history you can compute based on the multi-body system dynamics, you can use to predict the fatigue life. Now fatigue, in general, it has a two different fields. You know, there's a welded structures and non-welded structures. The welded structures is having the very unique features, and today we're going to focus on welded structures only. Non-welded structures have, are a little bit of different ways. But because, you know, Finnish industry is all about, you know, heavy industry, where the components are combined together using welding. That's why we are looking at the welding components. Another reason is that, uh, let me think. Yeah, I don't want to do the math, but a while ago, um, yeah, a while ago, I made my doctoral dissertation, and the doctoral dissertation was about 
how to combine the multi-body system dynamics and fatigue of well this structure so it's something that i kind of still feel that i'm close to that of course it's been i've been separated from the topic already a while so my knowledge is not as good as let's say or not even comparable to let's say to professor Björk. so i'm in another level lower level to be sure that you understand my position here okay but anyways i still remember something about the fatigue so let me share a few observations which not going to take much of your time but something that i feel that is educational for you even if you have passed the course about what is it fatigue design or fatigue something there is a separate course for that particular failure mode only okay now to make the fatigue prediction what is an information you need to know you need to know a little bit about the geometry of the joint and the structure you're dealing with material that is in uh, your components and the loading three items three items out of the t three items geometry is simple at least when you look at the big picture the details may be a little bit hard but it's simple checked material very simple typically very simple because usually we're still with the dealing with steel material so uh, let's say that this is checked what about the loading well that's difficult that's very difficult because loading needs means and needs loading history and that's a challenge that's a great challenge not at all easy thing to do now you can get that by using simulation you can uh, use a real-time simulation or faster than a real-time simulation. You can look at the different uh, scenarios, motion scenarios of the system and see what kind of loading they will introduce. And loading, I mean stresses. Okay. Now, uh, of course, the fatigue is something that is a statistical feature. It is not that you can say, okay, you know, the structure will fail always after this certain amount of work cycles. So it's not like that. You know, the fatigue failure is statistically distributed. And the certain amount of failure will take a place after a while. And the smaller value of failure will take a place even when the loading cycle is much lower than the one that it is here. So it's a statistical thing, which is important to keep in mind. Particularly because sometimes you can say, okay, you can hear to say okay the fatigue life of this structure is this and this many hours that statistically it can eventually happens in a very different time than that because you know these results are distributed statistically okay loading is a difficult thing that's already mentioned here now we when we're looking at the um, fatigue of well this structure you know, these are very different than non welded structure. And there are two reasons for that. The first reason is obvious. And the first reason is due to the welding process itself. The welding process itself will introduce or will introduce small initial cracks in this welded toy. So when you look at this carefully here, I don't know how to make it. This looks better like this. You know, there is a base material here, another set of base material, and this is welding here. When you look at the welding toy here, this, and when you're magnifying this a lot, you can see that there is a minor crack in this particular location. That's a problem. Because in a welded structure, the crack initialization usually is not taking place. There's already a cracks whenever you have a brand new system, brand new structure. And the whole fatigue life is dominated by crack propagation. So the, when the crack is growing in your structure, it is very heavily dominated by that. And this is something that you need to master, this crack propagation. Crack initialization, final fracture will take a fraction of the second because it's very rapid movement. But it's all about the crack propagation, how you can control the crack is not getting too big. It's going to be anyways in your structure, you cannot avoid it. But how to make sure that it is controllable, 
that is small enough that you can stand with size of the fraction. Give me the crack. Here's a short question to you. And uh, I will put the circle they want and I will let you time to answer this, but not much because I, I'm running out of the time. Here's my my soccer day. Okay. In well, the structure of fatigue life is dominated by crack initialization, crack propagation, final fracture. Which one takes the most of the time? Which one is the mouse that is dominating? All right. So while you're thinking about that, let me explain another problem associated to welded structure. This too is related to welding process itself. Because in a welding process, you're introducing awful lot of heat to your structure. And when heat disappears, it's going to introduce you, you are quite a bit of residual stresses in the welded joint itself. Remember, you know, this uh, I have here base material, base material, and here's my weld. I have here this initial crack somewhere here, and then I have residual stresses that are due to the welding process itself, and those are high. Those are high. They're typically roughly in a phase when you're having this strain stress drawing. They are roughly in a place when uh, the linear phases turn out to be nonlinear phase. So they are roughly, you know, as high as the strength of the material itself. This is a big thing because, you know, even if you're increasing or making it joint to be in a better material, if the base material is better, let's say you're using high strength steel. How that's going to help you? It's not going to help you because the residual stresses, again, will go higher up. They go in a corner where the linear phase is moving to be nonlinear phase. Now, this is important because as soon as you start loading, you're increasing your strain here. So you're going to immediately step to nonlinear phase, immediately. And now you need to understand that this is in a very micro detail that will step into this nonlinear phase. Very here exactly. This particular place will experience the the crack propagation. And this is a mechanism behind. So you're loading the structure, you're allowing the crack to crawl here. And as soon as you keep on loading the structure, you're always moving on to this plastic phase. Those are the two problems associated to welded structure. And now let me go back to the in class quiz, in class quiz, I have 18 answers. So I'm going to wait a little while. Now in the fatigue, um, when you're competing stresses using the multi-body sign dynamics, you need to forget about the very detailed stress level that are due to the like geometrical nonlinear, these this kind of minor things you cannot really capture, though these really high peak stresses you cannot capture by using multi-body dynamics. You can get this kind of nominal stresses that are the ones that are keeping your structure in equilibrium, but no further from that. This is what you need to limit yourself. And the method itself to complete the fracture will be limiting yourself to this very often used method that are based on the tables, pre-computed tables or pre-tested tables. When you're looking at your equal and stress rate and you are comparing that, you know, about the tables and see, you know, roughly with if it is under the acceptable value or not. Okay, so let's, uh, let me see what time it is. So we have a few minutes left and Here's Socrative. Okay, 21 students. Last time I think it was same amount. Roughly same amount. Okay. Game is on. My answer is this. 88. Okay. 
All right. So, um, can we close the game? You guys ready? I guess you're ready. Oh, okay, yeah, we got all there. I think we we are not going to expect to get more answers than this. Is that's when I'm going to cut the answers? I mean, the lottery lottery part will be got it. 91, 91. So did I get any? Oh yeah, we got we got it's the same winner than the last time. Here it is. Good work. All right, now I'm not expecting, I'm, you know, accepting any more answers, so you need to just, I got one winner only. No, we got, I got two, two, I'm sorry, two. Yep, two winners. Thank you. Yep, so, um, let me hide this. Right, back to here. Now, rest of the details, I'm going to leave you to to look at them. I mean, that if you really wanted to participate, really wanted to learn the details, you need to participate the course entitled Fatigue something, Fatigue Design or something similar. But basically how this, this guy, how the red fatigue works is that you are getting the load history from multi-body system dynamics. You are competing the stress ranges, you know, these deltas, you know, how often you loading and unloading your structure, because loading and unloading, that's dangerous. If you're just loading and keep there, having this minor vibration there, that's okay. But you loading, unloading, that's something that is dangerous, because that's when the crack is growing. And that's where you can figure out by computing these delta sigmas. And then you are uh, computing something that is having the equally damaged, like one delta, then there's this small vibration and large vibration. So you're comparing that, and then you're conducting the fatigue analysis. Typically, you're conducting that by comparing your delta against the pre calculated tables. Actually, they're not pre calculated, but they're pre tested tables. There is a lot of uh, experiments behind of the fatigue. You can use more fancy techniques like. Um, fraction mechanics, but you, then you need to get more parameters. And these additional parameters you can get possibly by using um, more advanced finite element modeling, boundary element modeling perhaps, or you can use a literature. Same holds if you want to use this hotspot method. So you need to get more information. All right, so I'm only having the one minute time left. So here's... Uh, something that is not reason but an example about how you can use multi-body system dynamics to predict the fatigue so this is a hydraulically driven uh, lock crane it consists of three hydraulic cylinders this one this one and then the telescope arm and there's also this uh, this turning machine here there is a four flexible members and it's loaded by constant mass here and now here's a, you don't really see this well, but these are the measurements comparing against simulation in terms of pressures, and they seems to accrete well. These are the stresses, simulation versus uh, or against measurements, and you see that okay, the strain stress, excuse me, the stresses are well, can be predicted fairly well, and I'm looking at the stresses in two different locations because these are the uh, the places that I'm interested in and then you can uh, actually build that kind of the fatigue life prediction based on that here's something that is interesting because look you know there's a welding here in a location that you shouldn't actually put the welding because this particular area is heavily loaded there's a high stresses in this area and there's a one welding which is a uh, not necessarily needed here because this welding was just a uh, you know welding these small knots that are holding the hydraulic pipes you can place this anywhere you want. Don't place the welding ever to places where there's a high stresses. So this is kind of lesson learned. All right, so next week, we'll continue about large deformation. I'm not going to spend much of a time for that, but just a little bit. Then there is a summary, questions you can find in a midterm exam, and then 
carrier counseling. That's about it then. So with that, I spent hour and a half. I wish you a good day and see you on next week, Wednesday. If anything prior to that, send me an email. Thank you. Now I'm going to close the streaming and I'm going to close the recording. I just need to find the proper. So where is my window? Here.